Good morning. Welcome to LaSalle. Would you join me in prayer? Mm, gracious God, let the amen sound from your people again. We gather today, wherever we are, across this country, across the world, to bring you praise and glory and honor. Have your ears been burning this week? <laughs> We have stormed the gates of heaven with prayers and petitions, with tears, and with expressions of joy. We have brought it all before you again and again in the dark of the night, as we rose to meet the day ahead, and as we laid our head on the pillow. We have continually been lifting up our voices to your throne. Today we ask, Holy One, that you would incline your ear again that you would hear these prayers, these words, these voices, these songs that we lift up with outstretched arms right before your throne of grace. We ask you that you would linger upon us, you would rest lightly on our shoulders, that you would do that thing that is your work to do, that revolutionary thing of bringing hope when we feel like we have none of bringing resilience when we feel like our stores are low, of bringing joy when we are waylaid by fear. So gracious God, be near to us now, we pray. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Word triumphant. It's in his name that we pray and all God's people say, Wherever you are, I invite you to join us in singing. Um, I know it's uh, a little strange for us to be in our own different places and our own different spaces, but uh, uh, this might be that chance for you. If you're not comfortable singing in public, you're in your living room, maybe. So go ahead and belt it out wherever you are. Um, just invite you to join us in singing this. Um, the the word Hosanna um, that we're singing here, that we'll hear in our text later on, it's a cry. It means save us. Um, so in the midst of these times, everything that we are going through, I uh, invite you to join us in singing that prayer out loud today. Let's sing together.
when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. to be worshiping with you all. Um, as we pass the peace of Christ to one another and greet one another, I invite you again this week to take out your phone um, and send a, a, an encouraging word um, or a prayer um, or just a word of greeting to someone that you know and love. It could be a LaSaller, it might not be, uh, but let's pass the peace of Christ to one another. i uh-huh. 
reading from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 11, beginning of verse 1. And when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away, and they found a colt tied at the door out in the open street, and they untied it, and those who stood there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their garments on it, and he sat upon it, and many spread their garments on the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields, and those who went before, and those who followed, cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is coming! Hosanna in the highest! And he entered Jerusalem, and he went into the temple, and when he had looked round at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the Twelve. Good morning, LaSalle. The place where you can come as you are and, say it with me, stay where you are. Thank you. We continue to try different ways of being church. And, you know, it occurred to me this week that the Greek word for church, ekklesia, actually means assembly. It actually is talking about people physically, really, truly coming together. So uh, it's a challenge, isn't it, to be church when uh, in the very nature of the word, it's about being in the same room together. I'll tell you what, though, there is some weird intimacy happening online, um, holy intimacy. Uh, these uh, meetings that we've been doing, uh, early morning, 6.30, 4 o'clock, the holy uh, happy half hour, um, our seven o'clock reflection, just some really cool stuff. So um, church, family, if you're interested in jumping in on any of that, I just really want to encourage you. Um, this week, of course, we begin Holy Week, and um, there's some neat stuff happening this week, Thursday and Friday. Both those services will be online in the context of a Zoom uh, platform, so details about that are on our website, and I really invite you to jump in on that. Easter culminates this week, next Sunday, uh, but Palm Sunday begins it. And um, today, with the time I have, I just want to frame really clearly what I think Jesus is doing in this Palm Sunday processional. Um, Jesus rides into Jerusalem, one of the last uh, actions of his life. This is the final week of his life, and I believe he is setting it up as a face-off as a showdown. This is the day when the powers collide, and we'll see it clearly in the cross, but we see it here in this triumphal march into Jerusalem. Jesus has spent every moment of his life trying to show us what it looks like to live free, to be free, and on this final week, he begins it with this incredible staged processional of telling the world, this is what freedom looks like. This, I believe, is a demonstration of street theater, a public play to remind everyone that follows, this is what it looks like for a free man to come in the way he does. So to be really clear, because I've got a couple of different points I need to make here, I want to say it really obviously on the front end. I believe Jesus rides in the way he rides in, unarmed, open, humble. And he rides in at the time he comes in, on the eve of a religious festival against a military processional, 
to publicly expose these powers that often go unexamined and unchecked, to reveal to us in this vivid play-like form that we will never be liberated from the powers of domination by domination, that we will never be liberated from hate by hate. Jesus is giving his last energy, showing us how we can live free of those forces. I say this every year, and uh, I think I do, and if I say it every year, then at least I'm consistent, and you have to give that to me. Uh, because at the time that Jesus is entering Jerusalem from the East Gate, there is another processional going on, this one from the West Gate. While we heard about Jesus coming down from the Mountain of Olives, making his way to the city, there is another legion of soldiers coming in from the other direction. And this one would have been pomp and circumstance the whole way. It would have been Pontius Pilate at the beginning of a long stream of Roman soldiers. And they would have had stallions and weapons and all the hoopla of empire. They would have ridden in by the Caesar's gate. They weren't there to profess religious sympathies. Rome was there because they typically were there on all these Jewish festivals. They were there to show some muscle. They were there to show these good abiding Jews just who was boss. Some of you have seen this, this arch, this arch of Titus that now stands in Rome. If you were to look at that seriously, carefully, what you'd see inscribed on that arch is a processional, a Roman processional from when they were destroying Jerusalem in 70 AD. And they had taken the temple down to the ground and Roman forces had taken all the religious symbols of the, of the Jews and brought it back to Rome. And they memorialized that great processional with that Titus column. Now stay with me here because that destruction of that temple was in 70 AD, roughly 40 years after the time that Mark is recounting this scene of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. 40 years after the fact Jesus rides in, but in present day writing of Mark's gospel. When Mark is writing this gospel, that is going on. That temple destruction is what is ringing in his ears as he writes down this day of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. It was clear to Mark, writing decades later, exactly what Jesus was doing. And you can see it in the way Dan read that passage, Mark 11, verses 1 to 11. The first seven or eight verses is set direction. It's Jesus operating as a stage manager. It's Jesus cueing the actors, getting the props, telling them this is what's going to happen and this is what you're going to say to them. The action of Jesus actually riding into Jerusalem on the donkey, that takes all of just two verses. That is a quick moment. No, this is Jesus carefully choreographing. This is a planned production. Rome's stage direction had chariots, weapons, whips, armor. But for Jesus, this final campaign is just going to be him. Unarmed and undefended. He's got a donkey. He's got some palm branches. He's got a road littered with coats and cloaks. Picture that in your mind for a moment. The Son of Man, sitting tall on a donkey, riding through the narrow gate coming in from the east, receiving the praise of peasants waving sticks, branches, <laughs> all the while fully aware that across town there are legions of soldiers also processing, goose-stepping, marching with their swords and knives and hailing Caesar. This is Jesus 
satirizing, ridiculing, lampooning the systems and institutions, the empire that thinks that they can control human existence. This is Jesus colliding with the machine. Well, how does that story from 30 AD, how does that story relate to us right now? Well, I've thought about domination a lot in these last few weeks. This virus has upended all the ways we think we control our lives, hasn't it? Half of the world is under a stay-at-home order. Think, think about that. <laughs> Half of the globe is being told to stay inside. No one is immune from the chance of being a victim or a carrier of this virus. Everyone is subject to it, I heard New York Governor Andrew Cuomo say. It is, the virus is the great equalizer. I don't care how smart you are, how rich you are, how powerful you think you are, Cuomo said. That was just a few days before learning his own brother had the virus, right? I thought a lot about power and control, about authority, about command, how we grasp, how we seek to dominate. Some of that's in good ways, right? We've seen researchers and scientists and healthcare workers use all the arsenal they have to wrestle this virus to the ground. But in other ways, the forces of domination have been particularly ugly. We've seen images of people demanding their authority, standing on their rights, and distressingly, it's often come from people who should know better. Like this guy, that Florida uh, megachurch pastor who asserted his right to hold his church services in defiance of medical advice and common sense and public good, he urged his people to come into his church building because that was more important somehow than actually protecting them from potential infection. We've read of university presidents that have restarted classes, personally welcoming their students back to campus even as students have become carriers. We've seen Asian Americans experiencing the effect of rising hate crimes as leaders scapegoat them as a source of the virus. Domination, techniques, violence of the empire techniques, all of these. But you know what occurred to me this week? That those are almost too easy of an example. They're almost straw man arguments of greedy pride and violence. They beg us to share them, to be outraged by them, because our own outrage can distract us from seeing the deeper temptation of domination and power. Because this is the insidious nature of evil, isn't it? When we get outraged about those kind of crazy examples, those egregious things, we have little energy and little time left to actually look deeper. Jesus isn't just going against the poster child. He's also revealing the kind of dominating power that normalizes injustice and oppression simply by continuing and promoting the narrative that this is all normal. Let me show you what I mean, because Jesus wasn't coming into Jerusalem just to go against the empire, capital T, capital E. He wasn't only exposing the active power of domination and violence, he was also going to expose all the passive examples of it as well. We're going to see it at the end of the week, right? Pontius Pilate doesn't 
actively put Jesus on the cross, does he? No, in, in fact, he washes his hands of that, right? No, he, he puts Jesus on the cross by not putting up any real resistance to it. Here's how passive evil has been acting. The thing that, it, that we've been told that it somehow makes sense for us to put a price tag on the lives of the elderly, that some lives are simply worth more than others. That the loss of some jobs should be treated more meaningfully than the loss of other jobs. That somehow it's normal that gun stores be considered essential industries, as essential as medical clinics and grocery stores and pharmacies. See, this is the role of the passive evil, right? This is, this is a self-absorption kind of thing that, that, that prevents us from looking and naming what the heck is actually going on. This is that self-absorption piece that keeps some of us running around outside because we don't feel sick <laughs> without thinking that it's actually not about us. We might be making other people sick. In myself, it's the same self-focus that makes me reach for the last few cans of tomato sauce on a nearly bare store shelf without pausing and thinking, what the heck? I, I have a half dozen cans in my own pantry. <laughs> but deeper, even deeper, deeper than the active forms of empire domination, the passive forms of complicity, Jesus is even going deeper than that. And that's why Mark's narrative is written like this. Jesus knows that there's a form of domination that goes deeper in the human heart, and he seeks to uncover that too. He forces us to acknowledge in this piece of street theater just how deeply we are held captive to the spirit of domination. The spirit of domination. You know what? Let me break this down for you because it is too darn easy to do, right? Let me break it down. The spirit of domination is that delicious thrill we get by putting our oppressors to shame. It is that intoxicating swig of revenge. It is the secret satisfaction of seeing wrongdoers get the divine punishment we know they deserve. Can I get an amen on that one from the sofa? See, this is why I think Mark is written the way it is. Stay with me here and look at it later. Because which of us would ever blame the people there that day who finally felt that their ship had come in? Their savior had come. Now, the boot of Rome was going to be off their back. This is why Mark's readers would have heard the description of Palm Sunday entry with greater and greater anticipation. Yes, Jesus is going against the Roman powers. Yes, he's fulfilling the great prophecy of Zechariah. Your king is coming to you. Yes, he's got a crowd of people with him. Mark draws all this symbolic, messianic action of expectation, and he rides Jesus into Jerusalem, and then nothing happens. Just as Tan read, he goes in, he looks around, he says, okay, back to Bethphage we go. It's Jesus yanking the curtain off the final, deep, insidious domination. We want a God who's going to put everybody finally, relentlessly in their place. Jesus won't have it. He's not going there. Sometimes when I read a post... 
scoffing at the severity of the virus, deliberately pushing it even now, even now as fake news. I have to say, I wonder, why doesn't God send this disease their way? You don't need to amen me on that one, okay? I've thought about my home state in the South, the unconscionable delay in quarantining, and I pause, wishing for what exactly? Accountability, yeah, for sure, at the minimum. But if I'm honest, I have wished for some sort of divine justice upon boneheaded decision makers. What is that? It is exactly the spirit of domination that Jesus is exposing. Asking me to see he is not going to have any part of that. Those prayers will go on to deaf ears. You know, I'm thinking that behind my need to dominate and control is fear. Back to what we said last week. Fear that is rampant. Fear that is out of control. Fear that makes me think, if only I could control this. If only I could control others, my environment, their decision, these leaders, then things would be better. Do you feel that too? One LaSala wrote me this week. She says, I am so filled with fear right now. I am growing increasingly terrified of my workplace. In general, nursing homes all over the country are horribly ill-equipped to deal with and stop the spread of infection, and mine is among the bottom tier. We will certainly run out of PPE, personal protection equipment, and before the point when we're going to need it the most. I'm scared I'll bring infection in and kill dozens of people, and I'm scared that somebody else will bring it in and kill me. So like many other people, I'm seizing control in every possible way. I cannot begin to calculate how many times I have washed my hands today how many things I have bleached, sprayed with Lysol, or boiled, and this was at home on a day off. Man, just speaking, just speaking, that it may be fear undergirding our need to dominate is helpful, right? It's helpful for me anyway. Because I can remember that God doesn't play by our rule book. Not then and not now. This is a kingdom of invitational love Jesus is bringing. Jesus is going to die forgiving those who have put him on the cross right up to the end. He's going to ask us to redirect our gaze to love. You know, this is the opportunity that's being offered us right now real freedom freedom beyond all of our judgment right freedom beyond our outrage some of us have risen immediately to the challenge and maybe it's who they are maybe it's a function of their work you know i think of um all these doctors and as a good doctor friend of mine has told me doctors have to get over their judgment immediately about the crazy things we patients do to ourselves. So doctors and therapists and nursing staff, they, they just get on with it, right? Others of us, let's just say, Jesus has got some stuff to work with. Jesus knew that real freedom will begin by exposing our illusions and our false gods and our own thirst for power and judgment but he also knew that it wasn't going to end with just exposing them. We have to be captivated by a more powerful love. And all the heartache of right now, that's the deeper invitation to learn how to love. Resilient love. 
love beyond control, love beyond proving others right, love beyond retribution, love beyond our fear. We're talking about resiliency, right? Courageous love, creative love. The kind of love that will go right against the powers of evil. That's what we're being asked. You know, for the last few weeks, <clears throat> last week, there's been a group of us who have been committed to praying twice a day for the medical providers and the hospital chaplains here at LaSalle, those who are on the front lines of this virus. As you know, one of the cruelest conditions of the COVID-19 is that there's people dying alone. It's so contagious and staff is so bare bones that people die without a hand to hold. But look at this. This is what some chaplains out at Loyola uh, Hospital in Maywood are doing. They are standing at the door of patients' rooms singing. Singing loud enough for the dying to hear them. They are holding up iPads, showing the faces of loved ones, family members that can't be in the room. They're broadcasting their voices over the room intercom. They are using everything they have to stand there with the love of God, to let people know you are not alone. Pastor Julie said that on Wednesday of this week, this past Wednesday, they delivered 25 meals to sequestered seniors. Three weeks ago, it was eight. And yes, that likely indicates a rising need, but also I suspect it indicates a certain lowering of defenses. Maybe a higher level of trust, right? a willingness to let others into that space. And then there's this too, and I'll close with this. This is a picture taken by one of LaSalle's nurses, Danielle Schroeder. She's a neonatal nurse. As Danielle was feeding a baby whose mother had abandoned her, this little girl, just a few pounds, reached out and held on to Danny's finger. It's almost like she knew that Danielle was a source of life. And she was going to hold on for all she had, with all she had, for all it was worth. We had an elder board meeting earlier this week. And one of our church leaders said that she was praying that right now, we might begin to see this time as agonizing and as frightening as it is, not only as something to be gotten through, but also as a time that would be holy and sacred. A time for a deeper understanding, a deeper awareness of the presence of Jesus alongside us, ahead of us, behind us. A time to draw nearer, a time to share our faith, a time to be free from the forces that so often hold us captive, a time to hold on for dear life. Brothers and sisters, as we head into Holy Week, my prayer is that we'll do just that that we will hold on to Jesus for dear life, that we will ask him to expose all the forces that even now continue to hold us captive, and that we would lean in to this unguarded, undefended example of love. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we seek to be free. We seek to live in the way that you lived. We seek to have on our own lips forgiveness for our enemies. We seek to live brave and courageous and true. 
we ask, Holy Spirit, that as we journey with you on this last week, as we, we reflect on the stories of the last week of your life, the things you did, the conversations you had, the struggle that you went through, the deep trust that you continue to convey, I pray that you'd take us with us that you would take us right alongside, that we would not be far from your gaze. We ask that we would learn how to love, that we would learn the language of freedom. And we ask this, Jesus, in your name. And we all say, amen. on thee, a shield and our defender. We go not forth alone against the foe. Strong in thy strength, safe in thy keeping tender. We rest on thee, and in thy name in thy name, O Captain of Salvation. In thy dear name, all other names above. Jesus, our righteousness, our sure foundation, our Prince of Glory and our King of Love. This is Lucas, and I'm coming to you from my incredibly tall stack of uh, seat cushions where I'm planning to build one of the most extensive pillar forts on this side of the Mississippi. Uh, I have a couple short announcements I'd like to share with you all this morning. First of all, directly at the end of our stream this morning at 11.15, the Community Hour group studying the book Me and White Supremacy will be reconvening. If you're a part of that group, you have already received an email with the Zoom meeting ID and password you will need to join. If for whatever reason you don't have that email and you don't have those credentials, please email me as soon as you can. That email is on the screen so that I can get you hooked up and into that group before it begins at the conclusion of our service at 11.15 this morning. 
Uh, looking at the week ahead, of course, the big item is Easter. Holy Week is upon us, and we have a lot of different programming opportunities and pieces of content we are excited to share with you this week. If you are a family with children, we have a couple videos detailing the stories of The Last Supper and Good Friday to share. Uh, on Good Friday itself, we're going to be having an interactive service over Zoom. And of course, on Easter Sunday, we will be having our celebration service. You will be able to find information about all of our Holy Week content on our website at lasallestreetchurch.org slash Holy Week. You can also get to that on the homepage and in the live stream links below. One particular thing to highlight on the Holy Week page, we are soliciting your direct videos about where you are seeing Jesus in the world around you, particularly in the moment that we are in. Maybe you have seen God in the service of a healthcare professional, maybe in the sacrifice of a day laborer somewhere along our supply chain, or maybe just in the beauty of God's creation, which you're appreciating right now. Whatever it is, we wanna hear directly from you. So please send along short videos to me, less than two minutes long. You could easily record it from your phone or maybe from a laptop. Um, doesn't have to be super high quality, but just share where you are seeing Jesus in the world around you. There is no observation too simple or too plain that cannot be a blessing to someone who needs to see that light. So please share those stories with me at my email by this coming Wednesday so that I can splice some of that together and we'll be able to enjoy it together on Easter Sunday. Also coming up this week, we have two ministries at LaSalle who are in need of volunteers. The Senior Market on Tuesday is looking for volunteers to help prepackage the food so that we can expedite our distribution process and also eliminate germ spreading along the way. On Wednesdays, our Breaking Bread ministry is also looking for volunteers to prepack food and deliver some of that food to our Breaking Bread guests who cannot safely travel to Cornerstone. If you are interested in volunteering with either of those ministries, please email Julie as soon as you can. They are looking for volunteers for this coming week. Finally, our elder board nominations are due today. A strong elder board relies on a strong and wide slate of elder board candidates. So if you know a LaSaller who would be a good addition to our elder board, please nominate them using our form. You can find that in the live stream links below or on our website or in eNews and submit those nominations today before the deadline ends. That's all the announcements I have this morning. Thank you so much for joining us in worship. I hope you have a great Palm Sunday and that Holy Week greets you with safety, peace, joy, and love. Thank you. Hey, LaSalle, as we live through this uncertain times, um, let's let this closing hymn invite us uh, not to seek to, to dominate or to seize control, uh, but instead to follow follow Jesus in the way of love. So let's sing this together.
Would you join me in our final prayer? Gracious God, I'm reminded of um, German theologian Jürgen Moltmann, what he said when he, he said, only a suffering savior can save us. We lift up the suffering of this past week, the suffering of the week to come. We lift up all the losses that we're going to feel throughout this week losses of jobs, losses of meaning, losses of purpose. Some people are going to lose patience. Some patients are going to lose lives. We ask Jesus, suffering Savior, you would hold it all. And we ask in that way that only you can do, that you would knit it all together and that this week we could enter fully into this holy week, remembering you who have gone before us, your invitation to love, your invitation for solidarity with you, your invitation into life and into freedom. So we lift up the events of this week to come into your more than capable hands. And we ask that your spirit would go before us and that we would leave this assembly, this ecclesia time together in your name. Brothers and sisters, we go from this time of worship in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.